On behalf of Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East and the University of Toronto Mississauga Student Union, I'd like to welcome you to this lecture with Professor Tariq Ramadan. I am Grace Batchun. I am the co-founder and VP Public Relations for Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, and I'll be your MC during uh, this afternoon. When we think the title of the lecture is Creating Thriving Societies in Troubling Times. What comes to your mind when you think of thriving? When we think of thriving, we think of flourishing. We think of growing vigorously, confidently. We think of prospering. How can we thrive when we have so many fears and preconceptions? Be it in the face of a new Trump era, east-west perceptions, and ongoing conflicts. Dr. Ramadan is with us this, this afternoon, and he has been with us, we're grateful to have him with us. He has been with us for the last three evenings. We started in Calgary, moved to Edmonton. Yesterday we are in London, Ontario. This afternoon we're here, and then there is another lecture at 7 p.m. in Toronto downtown. So Dr. Ramadan is here with us to inspire us, to deepen our understanding, and to guide us on how better to respond in these troubling times. And I really want to encourage you to consider supporting our work because we're only able to do what we can do because of support of people like you. Thank you very much. So Tom Woodley is the president of CGPME. I always say he is the motor, the enabler behind CGPME. He works a lot behind the scenes, but if CGPME is what it is right now, I would say 98% of that, it's because of Tom Woodley. So please give him a hand. But thank you very much for being here. It's really a pleasure and it is great and we appreciate your patience and your, your willingness to come out this afternoon. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ramadan. Dr. Ramadan is a Swiss-born intellectual, philosopher, and writer. Professor Ramadan is currently a professor of contemporary Islamic studies in the Faculty of Oriental Studies at Oxford University in the UK. He's also a visiting professor at the Faculty of Islamic Studies in Qatar and the University of Malaysia Perlis, senior research fellow at Doshisha University in Japan, and director of the Research Center of Islamic Legislation and Ethics in Qatar. He is the president of the European think tank, European Muslim Network in Brussels, and he's a member of the International Union of Muslim Scholars. Dr. Ramadan is also active at the academic and the grassroots levels, lecturing extensively throughout the world on theology, ethics, ecology, and interfaith dialogue. Professor Ramadan is foremost known for his writings, for his writings, multiple writings, and guidance for Muslims in the West, and for his analysis on majority Muslim countries. Mr. Ramadan has published more than 30 books on these issues. He also distinguishes himself as a thinker and speaker on human rights and social justice. And it is in that capacity that he is with us here tonight. He has followed developments in the Middle East for years and integrates his faith philosophy and personal convictions in his response to the emergence of various movements throughout the Middle East. Time magazine listed him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And he is here with us, and he is here with us in Mississauga. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Ramadan. Let me start with an introduction, three main points when it comes to the title. So those of you who are expecting something because they know that I'm working from within the Islamic tradition, uh, have been working on this for years and writing so many books on what, uh, you know, the 
uh, principles of Islam from within the way we have to deal with our principles, but also speaking about what is happening in Muslim majority countries or in the West. Today is something a bit different that I'm doing based on the title and based on the work that is done by uh, uh, Canadians for uh, justice and peace in the Middle East. In fact, I accepted to come not just to share with you some uh, views about uh, uh, some principles, but just to face up to our responsibility as citizens in troubling times. What do we have to do? And I'm not talking here to a specific community. I'm coming from a specific background, yes. I'm a Muslim, I am a Muslim thinker, but I am a human being. And I am a Western Muslim, and I'm visiting, so I have been visiting Canada for so many times, and the States, and all the Western countries, but at one point, it's very important to understand that the challenges that we are facing, we are not going to succeed if we remain in our community with our people in a fragmented way. It's time from where you are, with your principles, with your conscience, with your consistency with your principles, to reach out and to deal with your fellow citizens, your fellow human beings. At the end of the, at the, of the day, if your community comes first, as you heard yesterday, you know, uh, Trump saying, America first. I would say for me, in the name of God, as a believer, humanity first. And when they say, God bless America, I would say, and all the others. And all the others. Because implicitly sometimes the way we look at our people and we care about our people, we are able sometimes to be completely indifferent, as it was said by Bernard Shaw, about what is happening for others. So we care when our people are killed, and it's normal for other peoples to be killed, for example, like in Syria, in Myanmar, in African countries, in Asian countries. That's in fact, humanly speaking, it's not acceptable. We have an ethical problem here if we only care about our people. So my main concern this evening, or it's not evening, I have to use that it's uh, this afternoon, it's, it's to bring us together, and I'm talking to every one of you beyond your community as Canadians working for the sake of this country serving humanity. That's the logic of my... No, no, I, 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 I have... A fatwa. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know what is a fatwa, I say, oh, Salman Rushdie. No, a fatwa is just a legal opinion. I'm saying I'm asking you not to clap. I know it's cultural, you like it. But when you have and you like what you hear, think about it. Okay, you just think about it. Don't react emotionally to ideas. It's the wise way to deal with ideas when we like what we hear. We just keep it, think about it, and try to implement what can, when we can implement out of it. And not to react because uh, this emotional reaction to good ideas is diminishing the substance of our thoughts. And it's not good for me. When you clap, I could be happy that uh, you are happy. So at the end, let us come with something for one hour you don't clap, but at the end, please, don't clap. <laughs> okay. So don't clap. Okay. <laughs> it's a democratic decision. Anyway, <laughs> so when we are dealing with troubling times, what is happening? What are we facing? And how do we have to react to the, the world today? So what I'm going to do in the first part of this talk is just to go with you a journey facing all or mentioning the main problems that we are facing, the main challenges of our time. Sometimes it's really troubling and worrying, and there is a sense of helplessness that we can have, of despair, because the state of affairs is very bad, what we are facing. And still we have to be involved. So I will go through this. This will be the first part of my talk. The state of affairs, what are uh, the challenges that we are facing and what are the problems? The second thing which it's important for me when we are doing this is what I'm always saying. In fact, the world and the environment has an impact on you depending on the way you look at it. And the starting point is to be positive. 
It's to be positive. Whatever is happening, if you look at the world, look at the people who are doing something. Look at things that are going well. Be positive. You are not going to change the world, the whole world, but if you change something or somebody in the world, starting with yourself, it means that the world is changing. John Paul II was saying something which was very right. If there is one person which is suffering less in this world, it means that the world is better. So our take on this, and this is a spiritual, intellectual, philosophical attitude that we can't count. We should not be capitalistic with solidarity and humanity. We should think about the quality and we should think about not the result, the quantifiable result, but the quality of what we are doing. So whatever we do, which is helping somebody to suffer less, or a situation to be better, that's a success in itself. And, you know, I'm always saying this for people who are organizing lectures, they think it's a success when the, the crowd is here and the, it's packed. I'm not sure it's a success. Because if you are, I don't know, more than 300, and at the end no one is taking from what he or she is hearing something which is changing her or his life, it means it's a failure. So it's not about the quantity. Sometimes I, you know, I might sometimes travel 10 hours just to go to give a lecture, and there is only one person in the room who got the message that we have to be involved. So it's not about quantity. We have to get rid of this mentality, because this is colonizing us. We resist consumerist society, and we are colonized in the way we assess what we are doing, by the same logic. And I would say the starting point of this is to get rid of that. It's a liberation process, intellectual, spiritual, philosophical liberation. We are not, and we should not assess what we do on quantity, but on quality, on humanity, on solidarity, on service. The last point here, it's also important because, you know, I have been talking to people, I um, was asking, is Canada changing? Is there something? And I know that you are very much concerned about what is happening close to your country with the United States of America and Trump uh, and the, the last election. Things are going to change. And we are, you know, I remember 10 years ago, I was saying to Muslims in the West, it's not going to be easy. And I was even saying this before September the 11th in the United States. It's not going to be easy. If you think that you are going to normalize your presence, and that's not going to happen. So now we are still facing very difficult times to, go, to come. It's going to be difficult. But it's not by assessing and saying, OK, it's going to be difficult, that we need to be invisible, that we have to be scared and to be colonized by fear. It's time to be confident, to be assertive, and to do what we have to do, to face up to our responsibility as human beings. It's going to be difficult. No one told us it's going to be easy, but this is where we have to start. Confidence and uh, consistency in what we are trying to do. These are essential uh, uh, um, uh, uh, notions and essential features that are important with ourselves. So, for example, anyone who's coming to you, looking at you because you are black, because you are Latinos, because you are from the First Nations, or because you are Jew, or because you are Christian, or you are committed Christian, or you are Muslim, the starting point is, I'm confident. I'm who I am. And I'm not scared. I'm not going to apologize. I'm who I am. I have my principles. So consistency with my own self, and at the same time, openness, reaching out to other people. It's not consistent against, it's consistent with. Because there are lots of fellow citizens, lots of Canadians. They don't, they don't believe in God. Some are atheists, others are agnostics, uh, some are Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, Muslims, whatever. And even when I met the day before yesterday, somebody coming from the First Nation saying, all what you said, I agree with it. I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a Christian, but I agree with what you are saying. Meaning, consistent with my own self, open, to the consistency of others, with their values, with their principles, with their commitment. We have to come together. You are not going to save your community through only your community, but through people working together. Black issues, it's for every one of us. First Nations, every one of us. Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, every one of us. Injustices, social equality, 
every one of us. This is why we have to come together. So it requires two conditions. Consistency with our own values. So know who you are. Know who you are. Because the most important problem, why fear is prevailing in some societies, it's not because the others know who they are. It's very, it's very often because you don't know who you are. So when you don't know who you are, you are scared by who you are not. People around you. So this is what the populists are always nurturing this. My identity against you identity. So this is the starting point where we are trying to be consistent. We are assertive with our values and at the same time ready to work with our fellow brothers and sisters in humanity, our fellow citizens in Canada. And it means that we want to remain faithful to our principles and to serve the community, the overall community for the better. Now, what is the state of affairs? What are the problems that we are facing? So I'm sorry, for 10 minutes, I'm going to have a list of uh, fields, questions that we have to face today in our world. Not to get a sense of helplessness, but exactly the opposite. How are you going to react to this? Understanding that the starting point of everything, consistency with our principles, openness towards the others. So the same logic here. The first field, the first challenge that we are facing is something which is at the individual level. Every one of us in this room, if we are honest and trying to be honest with our own self, every one of us in this room, we have principles. We are all speaking about dignity. We are all speaking about honesty, justice. We are all speaking about solidarity and humanity. And we all know that in our private life and public life, it's very difficult to be consistent. Our societies today are making it difficult for us to be consistent with our own values. We want to speak about justice, and we know that sometimes we ourselves are unjust. Every one of us here in this room, everyone should be able to say, I'm against racism. And still, in the way we deal in our private life with such issues, it's not always easy. So there is a deep problem here, which is a very deep spiritual question. Many Muslims today, when they, they are talking about being Canadian Muslims, they say it's very difficult to be a, a Muslim in Canada because there are lots of, you know, the entertainment culture, the way of life here, the people are drinking, there are pubs. It's very difficult. By the way, you think it's easy for a Christian? You think it's easy for a Jew, a, con a committed Jew, to be consistent with his or her value? You think that any atheist who is working with her or his conscience just to be upright, just to be honest, is going to be easy? For all of us, it's difficult. This is life. Life is making it difficult to do in our society, in industrialized society, in a consumerist society. It's very difficult to be consistent. So we have to face this. It's a spiritual question. It's a philosophical question. And at the end, every one of us has to ask the deep question, am, cons am I consistent with my values and principles? Am I doing what I think is right? And if it's not the case, everyone has to struggle to try to find a way. So this is the first commitment. And it means that in our society, where do we find the problem where there is a gap between principles and action, between what you think and what you do? this very difficult contradiction. There is no one in this room who is not facing contradiction. There is a universal challenge of consistency in our intimate life, and we know that. Be you a Muslim or be you a whatever, that's the reality. It means that we have another problem in our society today, which is a deep problem, is about education. When you yourself, as a father, as a mother, are facing the contradictions within your life. What am I going to transmit to my children? How am I going to raise them to be human beings? Not to be obsessed with getting money or with having, but being aware of what it means to be somebody. The civic movement was saying in the United States of America, I am somebody. So how am I going to transmit? How am I going to teach my, how am I going to go along my children in the school system and at the same time say, 
Get the knowledge, be somebody. That's a challenge in our society today. And this is deep. This is deep. So I'm not asking ourselves here, be active and forget about these deep questions. This is the starting point. Consistency, education. Our educational systems, all our schools are, are in crisis. In the West and in all the countries around the world, we have a problem with what we are teaching, and I will come to this. So these are problems here, and add to this that every one of us, you know, when I come to deal with the Muslim community, very often the people are saying, you know, we have some challenges in the Muslim community. We speak about women, we speak about Sharia, we speak, we speak about so many things. But you know what are the main problems that we have? And I see this everywhere. When I was in interface dialogue, I saw this everywhere. One of the main problems that we have is a psychological problem. We have psychological problem. We have something which has to do with individualism, lack of dialogue at home, within our communities, within our societies. We speak about a pluralistic society in Canada. How much time do we allocate to communicate among ourselves, to listen to one another. So this is, we don't have time even. Time is just running, it's flying. We don't know how to deal with time. It's a world where time is, we are under pressure. While people are saying time is money, all the spiritualities are responding to, no, time is not money, time is life. If you care about time, you care about your life. Do you have time? Meaning, do you care about your life? This is a problem. This is a big, a big challenge. And every one of us, we have to deal with this every time. The way we have, we have to deal with our time, the way we have to deal with dialogue, the way we have to listen to one another. Many people looking at the West are saying, look at these people, they have to pay psychologists to be able to be heard. And some Muslims are even very, very, uh, you know, uh, dismissing about what is happening. But the problem is that in all the spiritual communities, in, a, in the Muslim community, as in all the communities, we exactly have the same problem. Lack of communication and people judging one another. We are not in a society where we are nurturing a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood. And I'm, I mean this. Sister, sisters and brothers in humanity. Means if you are my sister, if you are my brother, I'm sorry, give me some time. Listen to me. We need to communicate. We don't have this time. And then we come and, and we want to show solidarity. The first solidarity is not with money. It's with your heart, it's with your ears, it's the, the time you give me to listen to what I have to say. We are facing such challenges, every one of us. It's not specific to one community. This is part of the challenges of our time. We have to face this as something which is important uh, also. Add to this now. So these are also spiritual questions, by the way, crossing the board. Now we have the first level, and this, this is an overall reality. The first level is the social inequalities and the social problems that we are facing in our society. And when it comes to this, uh, there is something which is essential. Today, and in fact, it never happened before in Canada, Canada was known and is known as a country of immigrants. Everyone is welcome. In fact, the only people who are indigenous Canadians are the First Nations. All the others are immigrants. All the others. If you are fair with history, colonizers. Okay, we settle. We took from them and we say now, it's 150 years. No, I'm sorry. This country has a longer memory. First Nations are saying, we were here with a philosophy. And you forgot your, our philosophy and you take our lands. Because our philosophy as First Nations was, we belong to the lands. And you came and say, the lands belong to us. Two philosophy. One, one, but there is one thing here which is very important is that today, in our society, so when it comes to a society of immigrants or migrants, what was not heard in the past is becoming everywhere a discourse, a narrative. 
our pluralistic societies are fragmented societies. What is now visible everywhere is a new type of racism. The social problem, and when it comes to racism, racism has to do with power. Racism has to do with the way we define ourselves. So there is racism against black people. There is a kind of racism when we don't acknowledge the dignity of First Nations. There is racism when we are rejecting the Jews and there is anti-Semitism. There is racism when, for example, we have a discourse which is dismissing the Christian values. There is racism when we dismiss the Muslims and there is Islamophobia. There are racisms everywhere and we see this. The first thing that we have to do is to check our own temptation to be racist. And it's not enough to say, you know what, in my philosophy of life, in Judaism, in Christianity, in Islam, there is no racism. Yes, that's true. In your religion, there is no racism, but in your community, there are racists. So we have to face this. We have to face the reality of racism today. And when you see what is happening in the United States of America, Black Lives Matter, this is a very important question put to the society that the white supremacy is a reality, that the structure of our mindset, and then we have to face this in, the, in our life in a daily basis. So the starting point of this would be we are facing racism and social inequality, and we should, put, we should accept no hierarchy <laughs> between racism. So there is not one which is worse than the other. They are all bad all to be rejected. But this is the reality that we have in our uh, society. What is also important that we have to face, and this is why we have to come together, gender inequality. What I'm facing today, you know, I'm a Western citizen, and I'm fed up of people coming to me and say, you know what? You are a Muslim European, or you are a European Muslim, or you are a Canadian Muslim, or you are an American Muslim. You have a problem with women. What is the problem that we have with women? The way they dress. I'm sorry. I have to get rid of this. Even in this country, this, during the last election, the whole issue was about the niqab, was about uh, covering the face. That's not the real problem. There is a problem of gender inequality. But it has not to do with the way we dress. Let the people decide the way they dress. Let us come to the true discussions, the true problems. Yes, we are facing. Muslims have a problem with women, not Islam. Canada has a problem with equality when it comes to what? Access to education, it's good we are doing better. Access to the job market, not exactly equal. And the same salary for the same skills, we are far from getting that. Let us talk about the real issues here. So we are facing social problems when it comes to same skills, same salary, same opportunities when it comes to job market, or the labor market. These are the real problems, and not to come with superficial questions about the way we are uh, 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 deciding to dress. At the end of the day, in whatever uh, capacity, it's against Islam to impose into a woman to wear the headscarf. It's against human rights to impose into her to take it off. Let them decide. But same education, same opportunity, same salary for the same skills. Let us come to the real discussion. These are the social problems that we have. We have not finished with gender equality in our society. And this is why we should come also together. That's uh, the reality with... Uh, with uh, 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 with this. And then also, what we have at the social level, it's uh, the reality in our society of, uh, uh, let me just follow exactly what I wanted to say here. It's uh, uh, a discourse on, uh, that we find everywhere. You see it now in, uh, in the state. If you listen to what is happening in, uh, in, the, in Europe, there is adding, you can add to the social problem, racism, inequality, 
social injustices when it comes to the job market, when it comes to the labor market, that uh, there is racism and there is stigmatization. People don't get the job. We even have a problem with our schools. In Canada, you have second-class schools when we know it's very difficult to get at the highest level of university. We have, the, in the state school systems, we have a problem. And we have now, with our social dynamics, populism. And populism is what we find now it's the way, for example, politicians are dealing with us on an emotional basis. The populists are talking to our emotions, not to our minds. And this is why we are reacting, my identity, I'm threatened by these people, it's a us versus them mentality, and playing the victims, that we are under threat. So it might be that you are very happy today because after Harper, you have now Trudeau. And as a visitor, I would say, mind you, be careful with Trudeau. Not because he is a bad prime minister. I don't know. So far, he has very nice words. I haven't seen anything about policy. He reminds me of uh, Barack Obama. <laughs> Barack Obama was great in speeches to the point that they gave him the Nobel Prize the Peace Nobel Prize before even he did anything. And at the end, he did nothing. <laughs> Very nice speeches. If you listen to what he said in Cairo. And what we have now is uh, uh, Canadians very happy because it's not very difficult to be better than Harper. <laughs> but now we want facts. We want policies. We want to see something. And not when uh, he's visiting one of the most important uh, challenges for the people who are welcoming Trudeau somewhere is to get a selfie with him. <laughs> I saw him. Ah, great. And did you have a question for him? About what is happening with the migrants? About what is happening with the policies within? About what is happening with the Canadian support to some of the bad policies in the Middle East? Do you have questions? Or just uh, you are impressed and seduced? by some words, but not with real facts. Because at the end, this is what we want. We have to challenge. Not because we are against him, but we are for Canada. And anyone who is for the, 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 the future of Canada should question the people who are elected. What are you doing? We have elected you to do something, not to speak. Speak we can do, but you have power. And don't do as you know people are doing. They are very nice after they are not in charge. There is a club of former prime ministers. You sit with them. Wow. Very nice. I say, why didn't you do this when you were in charge? Why these good words? So, so good words when we are bad policies, and then afterward, we should do this. But you had power. Why I, didn't you do this? So the point here is what is happening at the social level in the political discourse. It's coming from on the social level is we are dealing with populism. And we ourselves, we sometimes are driven by emotions in the way we react to things. And this populism is to nurture the victim mentality. Ask yourselves, be sincere with your own selves. Are you going beyond this sense that uh, I'm helpless, I'm a victim of the whole system, I cannot do, so you know that when you nurture the fact that you can feel that you are colonized by others, that you cannot do anything, that it's us versus them, this is the starting point of a big problem. And populism could come from everywhere, not only from politicians. So these are the social inequalities, and this is at the social level. And I would say that we need to go, I don't know if you read uh, Kimberley uh, Crenshaw from uh, the feminist background. The feminists, and especially the American feminists, and by the way, for those Muslims who think that we have nothing to do with feminism, I say, don't hide yourself before, be, 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 be behind words. There are very interesting things coming from all these fields. And there is something what was coming from the feminist studies saying what is called intersectionality. Meaning, in fact, on, at the social level, the system of oppression, of domination and inequality is not only one situation where it's about gender. 
it's a connected factor. It's coming together. Whiteness, blackness, male, female, all this is connected. So we need to get a sense that there is a systemic reality. It's not only one thing. That, for, for example, we are facing Islamophobia, it's as if it's new. No, it's not new. Islamophobia is a new racism with an old system. The system was there. It's already there. So when, for example, we listen to what was, for example, if you listen to uh, Martin Luther King, when you, feel, you listen to Malcolm X, when you listen to what the, the, the women are saying, the black movement are saying, you can see that these are connected. It's the same system, the same logic. So you're not, you don't start to gain the whole, you have to be connected with the people who are facing this alienation or domination or the sense of being stigmatized. So this is why it's just crazy to see now, for example, people asking themselves, do we have to support Black Lives Matters, for example? Of course we have to listen, you have to study, and you can understand that the logic is the same, and even in Canada. So there is a logic here that we have to get. Having said that now, at the political level, if we look at our situation, we are all talking about uh, freedom, and we are free. We are more free than what is happening in many dictatorships. Now we should not accept this illusion of freedom. We also need to understand that uh, today politicians are spreading around fear, this emotional politics. It's no longer politics based on ideologies. It's very much uh, emotional politics. And populism is not only coming with, uh, 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 with uh, the populist parties, it's coming from the traditional parties. That when you listen, for example, for people saying, you know what, in Canada they are very happy we go, uh, with Trudeau, you know why? Because he's good looking. <laughs> that's, the, that's the end of politics. <laughs> the majority of women who voted for Bill Clinton, one of the reasons why, good looking. He's charismatic. So whatever he thinks, the, the guy who was very charismatic took a decision, sanctioned against Iran, uh, Iraq after the Iraqi war, half a million children killed. But he's good looking. The one now that we are praising, he took the decision, sanctioned against Iraq. At the end of the day, Malden Albright saying it was a very difficult decision to take but it was worth it taking it. Half a million children dying. And you vote for somebody, you say he's good looking. So now Canada is coming the same story. Oh, Trudeau, good looking. What is our assessment? This is populism, this is cosmetic. This has nothing to do with politics. So when our rights we put our rights in such a superficial commitment to ideas, thoughts, and politics, we are in danger. More than that is that now the new technologies, I keep on repeating this story because it was you as myself, we were surprised by Brexit. People are saying, how come the Great Britain is going to get out of Europe? And then we were surprised by Trump winning the last election. The day before, we were quite sure that Clinton was going, except that there was one company saying two weeks before the election, we see that the movement is going to change, that Trump can get it. Who was saying this? The CEO of Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica is one of the most important companies dealing with internet in all the data that you are using. They have, on an individual basis, 3,000, 3 to 5,000 data points on every single American citizen. And they are counting 230 million people. And they send emails, tailored emails to every individual, knowing who you are, where you go on Facebook, where you go on internet, and getting a profile. Dealing with psychologists, they were in the UK, and the guy, the CEO, saying, we saw two weeks before the election that something was going to happen. Who paid them? Trump. How much? $15 million. $15 million to do the job. So we are said that Russia helped him. 
but the technology, the way they were working, what does it mean? It means that it's not about ideas, it's about propaganda. And we are losing our freedom and our rights because we are monitored when we think that it's, it's freedom. Yes, go ahead, you are free, but you are monitored. In the way you deal with your internet, they are gathering data about who you are, what you like, the way we have to talk to you. So I think that this is very important. You know, powerful technology, being able to direct. And remember the powerful means that were used in Eastern Europe, that we call the European movement in Serbia, all these people taking to the street. It happened again with the Arab, the so-called Arab Spring. So all this, it's also the way we deal with technologies. And this has an impact on our freedom. And we need to get a sense, to be aware. It doesn't mean that we, are, we have no freedom, but we know that some are working on us from angles, from ways that we are not aware of. At least we need to know this. Our freedom is at least to be informed. And these people are, the guy who is behind this, he's a billionaire that he's putting so much money. He's a conservative. He doesn't want the pluralistic society. He has an agenda. He's putting billions in helping such uh, companies and corporations. Kozinski, Mikhail Kozinski, that it, all this, you can find this all, just use Google to know how you are monitored. Instead of having sheer Google that is going to give you a fatwa, just use this, just to get this information about the way it works. Cambridge Analytica was behind Brexit and behind Trump, the same company. And the same was saying, we knew, we are supporting. And we are just, oh, how come Britain? How come Trump? So some are working and they are putting money. And what does it mean? That at the end, who is going to win the next election? Who is going? The one who has money. It's about money. It's about, uh, not about votes. So when you hear, for example, that uh, uh, the five more richer people in the world have the same wealth than half of the humanity, half of the people in Yemen, billions of people and five have exactly the same rich uh, wealth. That's the reality of our world. So when it comes to this, I think that we have to be cautious and understand that we are facing here a, a problem when it comes to us here. Add to this on the political level that uh, uh, we are dealing in our societies at the political uh, level um, with no real political debates. If you listen to ideology now, we try to understand what are the difference between all these people? What are you going to sell us? Really a, a political vision for the future? Very superficial thing. It's much more about the way they look, the way they are able to impact, and it's very difficult in the political field. For example, in my country, that you know in my country, in Switzerland, the leading party is a, is a far-right party. It's other people who are able to uh, uh, ban the minarets, the people who are now, again, using the niqab by saying, we, ca we don't want uh, 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 to make it easy for people to become Swiss because who is going to get this? The Muslims with this threat that they are all. So all, all this business of working about populism and, and, and everything, uh, 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 everything like that, this is a political take that they have. So they are working on this, and, and they are working on, and this is the reality in my, in, in my country, that you can see uh, how they, uh, they don't deal with ideology, they deal with fear, and they deal with uh, this business of your identity. We are facing this in the, political, in the political arena. We have to get rid of this and to try to understand how we can resist with ideas to emotions. Is this possible? We don't have we don't have uh, a, a real debates. To the point that once I was on a TV uh, program and I was facing the leader of the far right party. And what he was saying about, he, he, he used three or, or, or four concepts coming from Islam just to show that uh, Islam per se is incompatible with the Western values. It was so silly, but at one point, in the political arena, when it comes to media, 
it's not enough to win the argument. Because in fact, you can win the argument and lose the debate. Why? Because the only fact that he's saying, look, he's very dangerous. He knows how to speak. He knows how to argue. It's exactly saying what he wanted to say at the beginning. These people are dangerous. So you win with your arguments, but you lose with the perception. Because the fact that he's silly is on his side. So when you have things like this today in our political field, these are challenges. How are we going to deal with this? To be involved in this discussion, this is the field. Add to this, the, the, what we are facing as challenges is the economic reality. And the economic reality is also connected to something which is very important in the political field. You are Canadian citizens. At the political level, you know that your government and yourself by proxy, you take decisions or you are involved in international conflicts and international policies that have an impact on people. What is happening, for example, today in the Middle East? What happened in Iraq? The support of the Canadian government to some of the American decisions over there, and the same for, the, for Great Britain, it's also having an impact. Today, what is happening in the world, in African countries, in Asian countries, in the Middle East today, Syria, and, and please don't forget some of the countries, because we speak about Syria, we have to speak about Syria, we have to speak about Iraq, we have to speak about Yemen. Yemen is the forgotten country. People are killed with the support of the Western powers today. They are supporting Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is an ally of the West in what they are doing in Yemen and in Afghanistan and in Myanmar. Myanmar, today the United Nations are saying this is the worst treatment against human rights, against the population. The Rohingyas now are completely uh, 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 are facing extermination and something which is a genocide. And by the way, please don't say it's only, you know, the Buddhists in, uh, in Myanmar, yes. There are some Buddhists who are dehumanizing the Muslims over there. But what about Bangladesh? The official discourse of Bangladesh on the Rohingyas is unacceptable. So these are Muslims or a Muslim government treating Muslims in a dehumanized way. So it's not us versus Buddhists. It's us versus uh, powers that are dealing with humanity in a way which is not acceptable. So we look at our own countries. We have also at the political level to connect. Our struggle here in Canada for more justice should be we deal with the world with the same dignity. So the dignity of the Syrian, of the Yemeni, of, the, of the, all the people, the Yemeni people and everything should be, it is connected. Today, the media are not talking about the silent colonization in uh, Palestine to the point that you can sit down and say, I'm for a two-state solution. But where is this state that you are talking about? There is no space to create a Palestinian state. That's a joke. The people who are going there, they are doing it. This is the policy of the fait accompli. There is no way they are going to have two states. And we keep on talking. And when the people are, are, are uh, going to Paris to have a discussion about peace, you have the state of Israel saying, this is exactly against peace as if they were for peace. It would be known if the Israeli government, Netanyahu has to do with peace, to be elected, to be elected, he said in Israel, to make it clear, there will be no Palestinian state. And then he comes after the election, say, no, no, we have to talk. About what? And the world is silent. Silent colonization. So we from here, we have to connect our domestic struggle for justice here with justice there. And there is something which is essential on the political field. If you feel that when Canadians or French or British people are killed, your heart is reacting more than when Africans, Syrians or Iraqi people are being killed, there is a problem in the way you deal with humanity. And this is not normalized. I keep on repeating when I was asked, say with the people, I am Paris, I'm Charlie. I say, I'm sorry. I will be Paris 
when you with me are going to be Beirut, Istanbul, Bali, Casablanca, wherever in the world there are Damascus or Baghdad. If you are with me all these cities, I'm going to be Paris. But to celebrate or to mourn the people who are killed in our country and accepting that others are killed with no reaction, that's unacceptable. This is structural racism that we are accepting because some people have more value than others. And you know what? That's the case. That's the reality. Some people seem to have more value than others. When, and, and look, to our shame, we woke up saying we want to welcome immigrants or refugees because we had one picture of a baby on the shore. The months before, thousands were dying, and the months later, thousands were dying. And it's as if one picture is getting our emotion and thousands, nothing. This is shameful. And this is the reality of our political commitment to justice and dignity. And I think that this is where we need to get this as. Uh, so that's important. The, the third field that I was talking about is the, uh, uh, the, the economy today global economy. It's working here, it's working at the international level. I said this just when we had the so-called Arab Spring. If you think that in the third world, in the global south, we are going to get democracy and stability where we have such an economic order, where the one who is elected has no power to decide whatever policy he is going to implement in this country, because the global economy is based on even here, even in Canada. The people who are running in Canada are not only the prime minister, transnational corporations, very powerful corporations are deciding for us. This is the reality of it. When Bill Clinton was saying only 1% of the people are running the country in the United States of America, he was talking about transnational corporations. They can decide for us. They put pressure on. We have lobbies that are pressuring uh, uh, the governments, but transnational corporations to the point that in the economic world, it's touching our daily life. Look at our schools today. Look at our university. This privatization of everything when it comes to education. Transnational corporations are putting money to create the, uh, and to support universities. We are expecting corporations to give money to university, thinking it's going to be free. Do you think that a corporation is going to give money with no expectation. This privatization of education is a problem. Education is a public service. Second that we have also is privatization of security. 4GS, the third biggest company, private company in the world, is dealing with jails, is dealing with our security, is going with monitoring. They are working in Canada for our security, jails, and uh, uh, our security, and they are dealing also with checkpoints in Palestine, in Israel, the same company, transnational, making money out of our insecurity. You are not secured, we are going to protect you, monitoring you, and we can get some money out of it. They are making money out of our insecurity. They are making money with even the, 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 the jail uh, industry and the weapons. So this is also something that we should know. The, it's not only about you know, voting, it's about understanding the whole system, the neoliberal system, who is working and how it's working now. And even when we are talking about, I said this when we had people being elected after the, the Arab Spring saying, if they don't get the economic stability, there will be no democracy. There is no democracy when you cannot, and even in our, for ourselves, we know how much it's difficult to be uh, free when it comes to this. Let me just go. Uh, quite uh, uh, quickly on other things. Also, something that we are facing, so it's the list, huh? the social, the political, the economic, and the cultural. The cultural today. Look, if you have to ask yourself, what is produced today coming from the in-depth of the Canadian culture? If you look at the industry today, what is coming as the culture is very much entertainment. It's not about deep creativity, 
the cultural production of something which is our roots. No, it's entertain and confusing entertainment with culture and arts. There is a lack of creativity. Our cultures today are very much close culture with some features of some values. If you ask, what is your culture as Canadian? What are you producing? Literature, painting, music. And by the way, halal music, OK? <laughs> there is halal music, OK? And for those who think that everything is haram, I, anyway. <laughs> I wrote about that already, OK? There is halal music and haram music. One, one sheikh once who was asked about, is cinema halal or is cinema haram? His answer was very simple. Is cinema halal halal, is cinema haram haram, <laughs> period. And yesterday, the, the, the organizer, they had somebody coming say, you know, there was music just before, the, the say, oh, music is haram. No, please, they are different. But what I'm saying here <laughs> is, because there are different opinions, but what I'm saying here is that when we are Canadian, when we live somewhere, it's very important to understand that this world culture is problematic. This world culture is normalizing our taste, is normalizing and uniform, it's a uniformity of taste and production. We all, you know, you end up in the mountains. I went uh, uh, in Yemen once I was in the mountain, it's a, a small village. I took the text, I, I took the textbook and the picture on the textbook in Yemen, in the mountain, DiCaprio. <laughs> this is the model. I went to Africa, deep in the villages in Africa. You want to drink something? Coca-Cola. <laughs> the world culture. And by the way, wherever I go, even when they come to Canada, yeah. I have some personal fatawa, huh? legal opinion. I have my fatawa, by the way, some fatwas. I don't drink al uh, alcohol, I don't drink, that's all true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, okay, get that right. But I don't drink Coca-Cola, for example. It's a resistance to a world culture because there is something in the world culture which is problematic with the way they are producing images and, and Hollywood business and all this. And we thought that uh, Bollywood was a response to Hollywood. Bollywood, Hollywood, the same business that the problem is which type, we have a problem here. And when you see, myself, you see your children, school, which type of imagination, creativity, artistic taste, production you have, which type of creativity, these are very deep problems, very deep problems. Because if we are serious about culture, it means you are serious about imagination, creati creativity, and all these arts that are so important. And at the end, there is something which is uniformity and normalization of standards that are not decided by us. So you end up drinking as all drink, thinking the same way, no real imagination. This is changing us into entertainment and there is the substance is lost. That's a very big challenge because it, 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 it's a confusion between our culture and we narrow our belonging to a culture to some of the features that are, in fact, against the other, not celebrating us from within. It's not blossoming with our values, is reacting and, different, and, 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 and working on alterity. It's the way we are making this otherness in cultural terms. That's a challenge that we have to face. So, and add to this with the cultural, something which we are all facing, environment, and it's very poor what we are doing. And, and we have to deal with environment. You know, you have somebody who's working in your country, Naomi Klein, uh, in his, with her last book, which is a great book that you have to read. But all this concern about environment, climate change, the fact that our way of life is destroying nature, is destroying the environment, that is also something which is essential to deal with. And we have values, we have principles, we have, and it would be good for Canadians to remember the First Nations philosophy. 
in the way you have to create to, to respect nature, the way you have to respect lands, you have to respect the landscape. It could be good for Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and and uh, and Buddhists to come back to the essence of their philosophy when it comes to respect nature. Resisting the consumerist society, making us a commodity among commodities. How are we going to deal with this? These are challenges. There is no way we are going to be consistent in political terms, social terms, cultural terms, economic terms, if we are not also celebrating a way of respecting the environment, which is part of uh, something that we have to do. And then, let me add to this, that uh, uh, in our world today, when we are facing some of the challenges, there is something which is important in our world. Our world today, with all the technology, with all what we have, it's a global, globalization means global migrations, and it's not going to end. Migrations is part of uh, the reality. We need to be serious about this. The only thing that we accept that could migrate today is money. Billions every second. But when it comes to human beings, the way we treat them, criminalizing migrants, it's unacceptable. And if we see even people being bombarded, as it is in Syria, as it is now in Iraq and in African countries, and millions are refugees, what is our take on refugees today? We have to deal with this. We can't, in our uh, uh, societies, industrialized society, just think about our comfort and not deal with migrations and refugees today and have a clear discourse on this. This is one of the challenges. We, have to be, we need to be more compassionate and well, more welcoming and to share. We need to share. It's time to share with people, not just to protect ourselves from we have policies that are uh, ending up with wars there, but we don't want the, people, the victims to come. And we are criminalizing them. We have policies where we are nurturing uh, uh, under development there, but when the people are coming with, you know, for somebody to, to leave his or her country and to try to save him or herself, this is a courage, this is courage, and we criminalize these people. This is where the big picture, so if you look at this and say, wow, there are lots of challenges in every field, social, political, economic, cultural, migrants, environment, all these challenges are uh, where we need to come and we need to be involved. And this is where we can have a sense of helplessness, but at the end, this is where we need to come with uh, uh, a clear understanding of uh, how do we face these challenges. The first thing that I wanted to say, and I, I insist on this, is that every one of us dealing with all this, you can't work on all these fields. And there are fields where we can do something you need to prioritize with one essential point, which is coming with all the philosophies and all the religions. You are responsible, do as much as you can. Make this world a better place in a field, in one. You have to decide. If you are good on social issues, go for social issues. If you are good on political involvement, go for politics. Both being involved in culture, do the job. Do what you can do in the field where you have the skills, when you have the capacity, but do something. So the starting point of facing this world with all these challenges is I will never be a victim, I will never give up, and I do as much as I can. At the end, it's the quality of my work. And I do it consistent with my values, open to others, as I said at the beginning. So this is where this philosophy is so important. Uh, the second thing which is important is this comprehensive approach. The problem that we have, having open heart, is that we are very simplistic in the way we deal with uh, issues. And as I said with the first part of my talk, all this is interconnected. And we need to get the comprehensive approach to work on one thing, but to know how this is connected. If you work for justice in Canada, don't work for justice in Canada without connecting this to what is happening around the world. Be in Canada the voice for the voiceless over there. And it means to be less emotional. It's just unbelievable. You take a position, you know, I, 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 I took a position on Syria, for example. My position on Syria is to say Bashar al-Assad is a dictator. And by 
any standards, I will never support this guy. He is a dictator, his father was his di a dictator. I see people who want to say, no, I'm supporting him because the people who are against him are supporting by the West, and at the end, reacting emotionally on a political position. We may disagree, but we have to stick to principles. A dictator is a dictator. Oppressed people are oppressed people. We may disagree, but we have to listen to one another, not to reject. Some people put me outside Islam, outside humanity, because I was saying he's a dictator. I went to Iran two months ago. And Iran is supported, the, the, the government is supporting. And I said three things in Iran. I said, I'm not, this is my first visit, and I have three things to tell you. Your policy supporting Bashar al-Assad, it's for me by all standards unacceptable. But I come to talk. I'm ready to have a discussion. I'm not going to put you outside Islam because I don't agree. I have a political disagreement. We talk. We debate. What you are doing supporting this guy, it's for me unacceptable. But I came in Iran to say it. And I said exactly the same about the headscarf. I said, you know what? Your policy on imposing the headscarf on all the women in Iran, I disagree with this. Because my position is not for the state to impose onto the women to wear the headscarf. In Iran, as well as in Saudi Arabia. It's for the people to decide. So what? I, and I said it in Iran. So we will have this. The, the first lecture is on my Facebook now. And next week, I will put the second lecture where I'm saying this. And also to say, you. Uh, uh, a uh, political system is problematic because it's uh, democratic to a certain point and then the, 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 the mullah and the religious uh, uh, authorities coming and, and saying what is right and what is wrong, that's also a problem. But it, it's, an, it's another discussion. What I'm saying here is that we need to stick to some principles and we need to be less emotional. We need to learn to, to, to listen to one another in political terms. You know, after the coup in, in Turkey, I, I, I responded to this by saying Erdogan is right on three things and wrong on three things. The reaction of the people say, if you say he's wrong, it means that you are supporting the West against Erdogan, and they put you outside. They don't listen. We are so emotional that there is no political discussion. It's if you say what I want you to say, oh, you are the best. <laughs> but if you criticize with arguments, something that I disagree with, outside. This emotional politics, we are all colonized. All of us, we have to take time, time to think, critical thinking. All of us, ask yourself on some, of the, some issues, for example. And to, uh, to avoid this binary thing, is you, are, you know, this uh, Bush business, you are with us or against us. And you could say, no, you know what? I'm against them, but I'm not with you. I have another viewpoint. So this is also something which is essential in our understanding. And it's a struggle, by the way. Mastering our emotions, being able to get more information and to be balanced in the way we deal with this, it's also uh, important. So to get a sense of complexity, it's a, a real challenge today. Because the way the media are talking to us, the way we are reading much less, there is a problem. This access to alternative media, Facebook, internet, is making us read less and read superficially, quickly. You know, if on the Facebook I put 10 lines, I can have 10,000 people reading. An article, 1,900. A book, <laughs> forget about that. <laughs> what does it mean? It means it's very superficial, very superficial. We are not going to do anything if we don't start reading, getting you know, a sense of this complexity, being involved, listening to one another, not going too quick to, to jump to conclusions. That's not going to work like that. And, and unfortunately, we are resisting a system, and we, do ex we are colonized by the system we are resisting. We are doing exactly the same. So this is where every one of us in this room, if you came this afternoon, at least you get out of here and say, okay, how am I dealing with my thoughts? How am I constructing my thoughts, my position, my opinions? Do I take time just to build this, to get a sense of reasonable rationality instead of quick emotional reactions? How am I doing this? this? Am I list this is a real struggle. 
that uh, it's important and we have to strive for that. And there is another thing that I would like to see in all this, because it seems to be very rational. May I tell you that sometimes when you look at our, uh, yourself and when we look at ourselves and we look with, uh, at the, the, the world, what is also something which is uh, problematic is very often the, that we can be tough with ourselves. So there is a sense of helplessness and sometimes say, you know, and I'm not consistent, I'm not doing anything, and we nurture a sense of guilt. And I would say that coming from the Buddhist tradition, there is something that it's universal in all the traditions, but the Buddhists are very much insisting on this. They are insisting on compassion. Compassion. And you know what they say, and especially in all the Buddhist tradition, the Buddhist Zen, and, and the, they are saying compassion always starts with yourself. Be compassionate with yourself. Learn to forgive to yourself. I'm trying to do what I can. Of course, I'm not going to change everything. But this compassion towards yourself is to deal with your own contradictions, but also with people around you. It's to be able to forgive. There is a lack of compassion and forgiveness in our social, political, cultural struggle. We need this. We need to forgive. We need to be compassionate. We need, this is a way we deal with, we do as much as we can, and then the people are trying around us. Instead of looking at the people in what they are not doing, look at the people, be positive. Be positive, you are trying. So what you are not doing, I can forgive. What you are doing, I am supportive. With your children, with yourself, with yourself first, your children, your relative, and with your society. Now, I come to my conclusion when it comes to his oldest, because I see that uh, Grace is just... Uh, showing me that I have to come to an end because we want to end at uh, 3.30. There is another lecture also uh, later. I would say that uh, facing all this with a sense of responsibility and consistency, consistent with ourselves and open, there are fields on which every one of us could be involved and we have to decide depending on your skills, depending on where you can do something. The first field, as I said, is our self-education. How much are we dedicating and having and taking time to educate ourselves? So this is also something which is essential in the way we have to deal with the world today. Much more education, and a young guy came yesterday or the day before yesterday saying, I want to be with you, how can I, 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 I follow in the footsteps of what you are doing? There is something which is essential here, is take time to self-education and reading and trying to be informed. There is a struggle today in Canada, for example. You look to, uh, at your fellow citizens, very often they are not informed. So what we have to do is to be informed and to inform the people. What uh, uh, this organization, Canadians for uh, uh, Justice and Peace in the Middle East is doing is informing, informing the, middle, the, 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 the MPs, informing you, informing the people. We, there is a struggle here for more information, to be more equipped. We need to rely on facts and figures, not on perception and impression. We need to get this. We need to have, and it, mean, it takes time, it takes effort. So there is a field here. We need to have citizens, and especially in universities. In university, this is not the place where we only deal with perceptions. We need to be equipped and to have this. Uh, uh, and at the local, local level, it's also to be involved in social justice. So also, there is a field here where we need to be much more involved in resisting racism, promoting a better understanding of equal rights within the society and gender equalities. This is where we need people working on this and being able to promote this uh, struggle. As I was saying at the same time, uh, uh, there is when it comes to the global economy and when it comes to consumerism, in our respective philosophies, how are we dealing with consumerism? It's also important, resisting consumerism. And sometimes, for example, for me in my private life, is that I'm trying to avoid some products that are, in fact, the symbols of this uh, 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 global consumerist economy. I say, I'm not going to touch this. And then also, do you have to deal with what do you eat? What do you drink? How do you dress? How do you resist the... the so this is why we have to come together. The consumerist uh, uh, is just making us think that you are depending on who, what you have, which this is not acceptable. So this resistance in the cultural side is also a field where we need to have 
citizens. I mean, we have to come together and also to be clear on this. Now, connected to the struggle of social justice, gender equality, dealing with the real issues, when the people are talking about the headscarf, talk about the salary, when the people are talking about uh, uh, races, talk also about uh, opportunities and what is happening in the job market with discriminations and what is also happening with the mass incarceration that we have in many Western countries today. The struggle within that you know that in Canada you have people in jail today, we don't know why they are in jail, they even don't know themselves why they are in jail. They are suspected and innocent. And they are in jail. It's now in the United States of America there is a movement about what is happening in jail. Some of the people who are supportive of the Palestinians are in jail for 60 years. They have done nothing but to put money to help the people for education, say, oh, there is a connection. I was banned from the United States of America for six years because I supported an organization supporting education in Palestine. And I said it when I came back. If now you're asking me to come to the States and to be quiet on Palestine, forget about it. I prefer never to go to the, to, to the United States. I'm going to speak about Palestinians. I'm going to speak about injustice, whatever it is, against uh, Bush and against Obama, because at the end of the day, Obama has exactly the same policy. Good words, dirty politics. So that's the reality of it, that we have to be involved in this. So you might not be able from where you are to speak your mind, but at least you have to find a way to let some people speak, to help, to help the people at least. I would say, by the way, don't be scared. What is going to happen? What is going to happen? Be assertive. Be confident with what you have to do. Speak the truth. Speak, speak the truth. Tell the, so be informed and do the job. It means also that it's unacceptable to normalize 150 people being killed every day in Damascus, in Syria, and we are silent, while our governments agree to disagree on finding a solution in Syria. They let the people die. They are making money out of it. The weapon industry is making money. They are selling weapons on both sides, kill one another, and we are making money, and we are silent. At one point, we have to wake up. We have to speak about what is happening in Syria, in Yemen, some of the forgotten countries. Yemen, Kashmir, today, this is what is happening. In Bangladesh, people are being killed. And we, we keep quiet. It's as if we are following in the footsteps of the media. The media are talking about it, we follow it, and we have an opinion. We have an opinion on media coverage. We don't have an opinion on humanity and justice. So this is why we have to come and we have to be involved. And this is why I'm supporting this organization, because at least I see people saying, we are not going to give up. We have to work. This is our duty. And connecting justice within with justice outside. So it's for the Middle East, but it starts here. It starts by talking. It's an, and if you are to be serious, you don't want our young uh, boys and girls, our young children, to go to Syria at least, if you want them to, to do something, do it here. What I have to say to young, to young people who want to go to, to Palestine and want to go to Syria, no, that's not the way. You are not going to solve the problem by going to Palestine or going to Syria. You are going to help the people if you are citizen, committed, working for justice, speaking out here. You are Canadian, speak out, stand up. This is what we need. This is where we have to come together. And it's not only a business of black for black, Muslims for Muslims, no, humanity. It's human beings for humanity. So we have to come together. This is the best way to protect us for the future. And my conclusion here on this, and, and for example, you know, I have heard that some were trying to criminalize BDS, for example. We, are, we need to have nonviolent resistance everywhere to injustice. Nonviolent resistance be speak out, do something. So, for example, yes, we have people from within in, in Israel and outside. We did it with South Africa, and it worked. Working against the apartheid, reality was we boycott some of the products coming from South Africa. And it worked. So some, now you have people saying, and this is why some of the pro-Zionists are not very happy with the BDS, because they know that on the long term it's going to work. Because it's two things. You spread awareness and you uh, stop buying and you stop supporting in a passive way the Israeli policy. So boycott, divestment, sanction, this is something which is important. And this is the way we are saying 
we are not supporting violence, but you are not going to criminalize nonviolent actions. We will not accept that. And you have to do this. But if now Canadians are scared, so you are scared of nonviolence resistance, you don't support violent resistance, you are against justice, but you are passive. At the end, you don't know anything. You don't do anything about it. So this is where we have to be involved when it comes to, uh, to this reality uh, uh, today. And uh, the last thing that I wanted to say with all this, so, so these are fields. And once again, all the lists, all the elements of the list that I mentioned, this is where we should get rid of the victim mentality. We should stand up. We should be assertive and work within our respective communities and reaching out. This is a spiritual struggle. It's an intellectual struggle. It's a social struggle, a political commitment, an economic positioning. It's a cultural production that we want, which is different from what we have now. And it connects what is happening within and outside. And this is why I'm always, this is why also I'm very happy with, with the organization. They are uh, uh, successful in gathering people from different backgrounds. It's not only Muslims, it's not only people who are Canadian, it's, it's a mixture. It's the plurality, plurality and pluralism that we have within the society. So this is why we have also to come together and based on uh, being quite lucid and humble about the reality of our world. The world, it's very complex, it's not going to be easy, but we have to look at the world the way it is with lucidity and then we have to be to humbly, uh, in a humble way, we have to be committed for justice and, and peace. There is also something which is important, and this is why I was mentioning for get, uh, forgiveness and compassion, to avoid being arrogant in the way we are dealing. Arrogance is, is the worst thing that we can do, because some, they think that because they are doing something, they look at others in an arrogant way. We are serving, we are not, here to be served, and we are serving justice and humanity, and this is where we need to be uh, uh, involved. And the word that I'm always using at the end of the day, you have been listening to me for a bit more than one hour, and there is one word which is essential, with humility and with commitment, is uh, what I'm seeing, because you know, uh, 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 we heard Grace saying, everything is done by Tom, Tom saying everything is done by Grace, and at the end, it's a couple that is committed to, to justice. But there is something that we can see in the way they are, they, are, they are very humble in the way they are working. But there is something which is essential. That at the end, you have to ask yourself, when you are consistent with your values, whoever you are, you are atheist, you are agnostic, you are Jew, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, whoever you are, the consistency with your values today takes Courage, speak out, do the job. Courage means I take time to be consistent, I take time to do something, I take time to speak out, I'm ready to pay a price. If you are not ready to pay the price of facing, you know, or being banned from countries, at least the courage to take time to dedicate some uh, time, effort, money, to support the struggle. This is what is expected by us. This is what we have to do today. And I came to this lecture and I talked to you on a personal capacity at every single individual. No one can leave this room and say, I have no power. That's not true. The power to change minds, the power to educate, the power just to influence politicians, Grace was telling you, if only, for example, the Muslims knew how much power they have in this country. Instead of taking selfies with <laughs> the prime minister, <laughs> just ask some question. You are joking, but I can tell you something, a very sad story, a very sad story that I witnessed myself just after what happened uh, in Iraq and what happened, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, in the UK in 2005, after the, 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 bomb, the, the terrorist attack in London, 7-7. And Tony Blair was coming and saying, no, there is no relationship between killing the people in London and what we are doing in, in Iraq. He was wrong. Ethically, he was right, of course. I keep on repeating, nothing can justify killing people in London. We have to condemn this. 
But we have to condemn the policy that he was supporting. He was supporting and following in the footsteps of Bush and killing people in, in, uh, in Iraq. He is responsible of hundreds of thousands of being, people being killed. And he gathered the Muslims once and the leadership. People just one hour before he came, they were quite critical towards his policy. When he came, they were, they, there was a queue for shaking his hand and taking picture. If this is our leadership, we are lost because this is compromise and no courage. This is coming in within the Muslim community, but I can tell you something, we are all the same. Facing power, we are missing courage. Facing power, we are missing dignity. So at one point, we have to ask ourselves which type of power we are promoting. And this is a call that I am just putting to you now. More courage and more commitment to justice with no fear when we are facing power. Because at the end, their power is our, at our service, not us at their service. Thank you so much. So my question is, um, how do we fight the ideology in the Muslim families that the true education is um, hard science rather than social science so that we can actually prepare and give tools to kids to battle these problems? I got it. Thank you. My question is, what is the difference between the concept of Muslim Ummah and the Muslim nationalism and how the Muslim nationalism fit in the concept of humanity? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, enlightening lecture. My question is uh, specifically regarding um, policy on Syria. You mentioned Syria. And um, I think uh, if you were talking about injustice, um, if you look at the perspective of the Syrians and even from the government and you claim that they are dictators and they may be or may not, isn't the resistance from their end against the Western regimes doing what they did in the Middle East also justice for what they're doing and standing up for? I mean, why do we discard what they are doing in terms of resisting the movement? So that's my question. Uh, donc, um, vous parlez de, de uh, se réunir et de partager des valeurs communes avec d'autres parties de la communauté nationale, des autres Canadiens. Le problème, c'est que uh, ces derniers temps, on s'aperçoit que les valeurs, par exemple, les valeurs de la République en France, parce que je suis française, ou, ou aux États-Unis, ou même au Canada, certaines valeurs sont plus partagées, alors qu'on pensait que c'était sur elles qu'on pouvait avoir un, une base commune. C'est quoi, que, quoi la question ma, ma base commune, c'est comment justement euh, pouvoir travailler avec des gens qui ne croient plus en la liberté, l'égalité et euh, les valeurs basiques de la République. Thank you. Merci. Je suis très remercie d'être capable de venir et d'écouter à vous dans un pays démocratique où nous pouvons exprimer et partager nos idées. Mais vous êtes critique. I'm very happy. Oh, okay. I'm very happy. <laughs> thankful. I said thankful. I'm very thankful. Yet, you're, 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 I learned from your critical thinking through this lecture and previous lectures and reading your books that democracy has problems also. And I'd like to hear from you your insight. You know, Islam, as an Islamic scholar, that Islam has a lot of solutions. And I think. You know, you probably didn't say it in, in, in a very clear way, but I think as Muslims who are appreciative of being able to live in a democratic society where our, where our voice is heard, I'd like, I'd like some insight about what we can give democracy from an Islamic perspective. Assalamu alaikum. Thanks, Dr. Ramadan, for being with us here today. Unfortunately, Superficial emotional reactions in political and other areas are facts that w probably won't change overnight. So what actions can we take in your opinion against crowd manipulation through media um, with our limited resources and currently less established organizations? So because even with great and very important efforts that some of our organizations are, uh, are, are doing, we're still reactive to what's out there. So how can we be more proactive? Thank you. Um, you were talking about emotional politics and how that's uh, an issue, but isn't it like different than um, being against someone for things such as like injustices and killings and things like that? So I would like 
close my mind to someone who supports these things, but it's technically emotional. So is that emotional politics? Should I do that? Not. Um, so you talked a lot about intersectionality and how uh, gender issues overlap with racism. And I'm wondering how the LGBT, LGBT community is integrated in a Muslim platform to protect all humanity. Okay, my question is, do you believe that once you choose uh, to believe in God, especially as a Muslim, that um, creating peace and acting against injustice is the first and foremost human duty? And if that is, uh, and, and what are the real problems why this message is not getting across to the large bulk of people uh, to promote justice, you mean? Correct. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramadan. It's the first time I've heard you speak. My comment is wow. My question is. Your comment is why? It, wow. Wow. Thank you. Hello. My question. Wow. Uh, uh, almost. Uh, after my husband and I just watched uh, Thrive, the movie. Uh, we would like to know if you are in sync or if you have an affiliation with the Thrive organization that is actually in the United States. Assalamu alaikum. You said we should read. Who should we read and what should we read? And is it ethical to give money donations to politicians to get things pushed because that's the only way things get done? Yeah, my question is about Syria. Uh, the, the Syrian government is a democ democ democratically elected government. And you don't seem to get that. They're fighting foreign back criminal groups. The first question was about the social sciences and uh, uh, the fact that very often uh, within the family we are promoting, you know, computer sciences, uh, medical doctors, and I think this is right. There is a problem here in the way we are looking at social sciences. It's as if, you know, some did really think that philosophy, sociology, uh, social uh, sciences are not so important. It, they are critical today. Of course, if you want to be a medical doctor, that's fine. But these uh, things that you have a you, to succeed is to be a computer scientist, is to be an engineer, or to be a medical doctor. No, that's not the, you know, it's not about, it's, it's really that now we need to have people everywhere. So you, if you are going to literature or social sciences, that's very important. And it's really important to, uh, uh, to have people in these fields. Uh, uh, something which is important about the Muslim Ummah and the Muslim nationalism and humanity. First, we have a problem with the notion of Ummah. Ummah is wider than what we are saying. Even the, the you know, Ummah could be an individual. Can uh, uh, Ibrahim Ummatan Qanitan and Lina? So he was himself an Ummah. It, was, it is a spiritual community when we are talking about Muslims and a community of principles is not a community of blood. So meaning a community of principles is that the spiritual communion that we have as an ummah is uh, also based on principles. I have to stand up against my own brothers and sisters in Islam if in Islam and in the name of Islam they are behaving against the Islamic principles. So this is why I stand up and I say Daesh and these people who are killing innocent people are behaving against the principles of Islam. I'm not going to say you are not Muslims. I'm going to say what you do has nothing to do with Islam. I'm not going to put you outside Islam, but I have to condemn what is done in the name of Islam. So we have to do this. So this is a community of principles. And even at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he, the, the Jews and the Christians were part of the Ummah. Meaning they are people of our community, they have the same rights and the same duties. So the spiritual community is not an exclusive community, my blood, my community against others. No, it's my spiritual commitment with my principles serving humanity. So there is nothing against being part of the spiritual community serving Canada with one condition. It's not Canada and I forget the others. It's not Canada beyond everything. This mentality of nationalism is something which is not accepted. I'm not going to protect the Canadian people and forget about humanity. I'm going to protect Canada by showing concern and respect to every single human being. 
migrants, refugees, uh, visitors, residents. This is why we are, we, to be very clear on nationalism is very dangerous when it comes to my people first, my country first. You know, uh, Trump is dangerous because of this. America first, what does it mean exactly? What about the, the other people? What about the way you are dealing with some uh, other countries? So this is, uh, so, and we are serving humanity in the same. About the Syria, and I will take the first, the, this third question and the last one uh, uh, that came about Syria. So uh, I think that we may have different opinions about uh, uh, what is happening in Syria and uh, the way that, for example, we can think that what is happening in Syria is also resisting the West. I'm not so sure that this is the case. If you study what happened in Syria over the last uh, uh, 20 years, uh, in fact, the rhetoric against, uh, the, for example, the state of Israel and what was done at the local level, uh, I think that we are not, it's not black and white. Of course, many things that were done by even a dictator could be understood as being good, as being right. Not everything is wrong. The question is, what are the parameters on which we determine if uh, somebody is uh, doing right or wrong? So some of the activities and some of the actions could be good. Now, the principle of him in what he's doing, this is where uh, uh, we have to assess. So you are telling me that I am saying things that are wrong, that uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad was democratically elected. We might don't have the same idea of democracy because Sisi and Mubarak, they were democratically elected. And they have something which is very special. They are democratically elected for life. I disagree with the way you think that he was democratically elected. I think that uh, democracy in Syria, in Egypt, in all these countries is a joke. It's a joke. It's when I was told that Ben Ali was elected by 99.5% uh, uh, 100% uh, 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 people uh, supporting. That's a joke. Mubarak was not democratically elected, and the guy was not. He was elected after his father. And we know how much the people who were supporting his father supporting, supported him at that time. So he has nothing to do with democracy. There is nothing to do with democracy. We have the right to say it. The question now is, how are we going to find a solution in Syria? It's not by saying he was democratically elected or by saying that the opposition is completely black and white. There is a problem here, and the first step is to stop the bloodshed, is to stop and to ask all the countries, Russia as well as America, stop supporting one side and agree to disagree and to let the people be killed. This is the first step. The, the next question was in French about the fact that uh, uh, I was talking about the fact that we have common values. What if, you know, and she was taking the example in France, we are seeing people who are not having, or they are forgetting the values that we were talking about when it comes to freedom, or freedom of expression. Uh, uh, what do we do when the people, I think that we have to be very cautious here. The uh, majority narrative or rationale that we have, for example, in France, or even in Canada with some of the people, with an, even with Harper. It's not because you have people who are uh, promoting uh, a very bad and superficial or even counter narrative about freedom of expression or equal uh, rights for, that we have people who are uh, uh, forgetting these values and they are distorting even the very meaning of freedom of speech, for example. They are, they are saying this is a country where we have freedom of speech, but uh, it's double standard. You can criticize some and you cannot criticize others. So now, for example, uh, she, she was asking about France. This is the only country where for the last 10 years I was unable to speak in any university. I cannot get a venue like this one. It's impossible for me in France. We have to go in the suburbs with uh, private uh, uh, venues and we have to pay. The, the, the public, it's impossible. And this is the, the country where you have and uh, they are celebrating the so-called freedom of expression and everything. And they are saying, in the name of the freedom of expression, we have to suppose Charlie, but you don't have the right to speak. The point here is to be very cautious, not to generalize. There are lots of French people who are sharing our values. So we need to work with them. We should not generalize and saying France is a racist country. That's not true. We have racists in France, but we have lots of people who are with us in the struggle, lots of people. 
Lots of people are. So we need, and in Canada it's exactly the same. So we need to avoid this uh, uh, optic illusion that we are putting all the people in the same box. We don't want to be put in the same box. Don't put the people in the same box. Try to find the right people with whom you can work, and there are many. Um, about uh, uh, democracy, and yes, there are lots of problems, and I had a, a previous lecture, I talked about this in, a, uh, uh, in uh, the, the, the lecture the day before yesterday, when I was saying the democracies that we are living in are lots of, we, we are facing lots of challenges, and I mentioned some of them now. Now, we have to be critical. We want to improve the democratic processes by saying we want less you know, transnational corporations and lobbies to influence the politicians, so we have to be involved. Now, from an Islamic viewpoint, we have lots of principles that are very important. So, we can add to our critical discussion on democracy things that we need to, to, to know coming from our tradition, and this is what we can share. But we'll find, for example, there will be no democracy if there is no education. So we have to educate. The, the education means to get the knowledge of what is happening and to get the knowledge of the system itself and the law of the country. So we need, for example, to say in Islam, and in fact it's exactly the same in democracy, there are conditions for you to elect somebody. Competence is one of the uh, features. Uh, competence, integrity, honesty, and then accountability. All what I'm saying here is very Islamic. If you want to vote for somebody, I'm asking you, are you competent? My first question is not, are you a Muslim? The first question is, you, because you can be Muslim and incompetent. You don't know nothing about the business. And we have some MPs, they want to come to us and say, you know what, I am a Muslim. Yes, but you may not have the competence for that. So the question is competence, integrity, and probity, and, and honesty, it's important, and accountability. So what could be interesting is for all the citizens coming from a Muslim background, but they will find exactly the same values with others, with other backgrounds, say, this is what we can bring. And if we want to, to be involved, so some of you being involved in politics, go for politics when you have some competence and skills and when you are trying to be honest and you are accountable. Accountable means that what we want from our politicians is not to come to us every five years or four years. It's an ongoing process. If you want us to vote for you now, we want to see you every uh, at every step of the, your mandate to see and to assess what you are doing. But to, uh, we are used, and some are just coming, uh, Grace was telling me how many MPs, for example, and politicians come to the mosques exactly just before the election, because they know that in the mosque there are lots of people. But the shame is not this. They are playing the game, they are politicians, so they come where the people are. The problem is the people who are welcoming them, and they, don't, they agree that they are, they are being used and not getting the real way of dealing with politics. At the end, I'm not here to be sold, and not, uh, to, to, I'm not here to be bought, and I'm not going to sell myself. I'm going to question. So this is also something which is very important in our added value in the, the discussion. So, uh, what, which type of uh, action against uh, the political manipulation uh, manipula uh, 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 manipulation that we have in the in uh, in politics, for example, and once again, I, I, I said it in the in the, yes, politicians are trying to, uh, and we have the media and we have uh, manipulating our uh, minds and our and us in a way we know this and it's lots of propaganda and we know that the owners of the media. Uh, uh, are working very hard. It's true in Canada with some owners who have media on both sides and they are putting money. The question is three things that are needed. I, I insist. There is a question of self-education, ongoing education, just to get to read and to know and to have multiple sources of uh, information. Just this is something which is important. The second 
uh, attitude with this is with the facts and the figures is also to be connected with some organizations who are doing, you can't read everything and you have to trust some sources and you need to be connected. So the way to try to avoid being manipulated is to add and to multiply the sources of information and the people with whom you are working, not only within your community, be, be careful. Because I saw this myself, people that I trusted so much on many fields, I realized that when it comes to the, their specific field, they can be very emotional and distort facts. What I was saying about Turkey. So people with whom I was working, trusting them, when it came to the government, I saw that they were able to say things that were completely wrong. For example, when I was saying about Erdogan, you can't say that Fethullah Gülen are all terrorists. Not all the people who are working at the grassroots level. You might disagree, they were against, they were uh, manipulating, infiltrating, that's fine. But all the people are all terrorists? This is exactly what the dictators are saying. So I said that. People with whom I have been working for 20 years accepting this. I think, how come? So it's not only to trust your source, it's to check the facts every time. So this is the way we are. So this is one thing, so emotion. No, to, not to listen to people who are supporting dictators. Uh, it could be a political or an intellectual attitude. But still, I will always advise, listen and debate. You may disagree, but listen. And for example, the fact that he stayed and he listened, that's fine, that at the end he leaves. That's fine as well. But uh, I think that we should not close the door for critical discussion. But to be clear, if you are supporting dictators, if you are supporting silence before dictators, I'm going to listen to you, but I, wouldn't, I would never accept that. So being clear about our principles that doesn't mean that we are uh, deaf or, or we don't want to listen to people. A critical uh, uh, listening process, it's also uh, important here uh, about I wanted to respond to this question because uh, it's a big question in the States and now in Canada in the West what about LGBT how are we going to deal with homosexualities and and and, and some Muslims are saying no way because Islam is against this we are not going to and there is a position of principle here and the position of principle is be consistent with your values speak your mind if you don't promote and you don't think that homosexuality is right, you have the right to say it with one condition. The condition is, I may disagree with what the people think and do, but I should show respect who, to who they are. So to say, for example, if there are here a process, I'm not going to support, I'm not going to say homosexuality is Islamically good. No, in Islam, in Christianity, in Judaism, it's not. Now, what you do is your business, but who you are is my business. My business is I'm going to show respect and I'm not going to accept stigmatization and, and, and uh, targeting homophobia and all this. This is not my way of dealing with things. I differentiate between what you do, you may agree or you may disagree. Who you are, I am told by God that every single human being is a dignified human being. So this dignity is yours. I'm going to respect who you are, and I may disagree with what you do. And this is the way I deal with my society. It's a clear position of principle. But in the name of respecting you, don't ask me not to respect my principles, not to respect what I think. Let us be able to speak our mind and to say, I think that this is right. In, in a moral uh, 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 on moral parameters, on moral reference, we should be able to say what we, wh what we have to say and to be able to speak our mind freely. But uh, respect is essential. And all this business that we have with some Muslims not being clear on this. And you know what? What I'm saying here, I'm saying it here, but this is exactly what I'm saying in the mosque. And it's exactly what I'm saying in Muslim-majority countries. I went to Morocco, I went to Senegal, and I was saying exactly the same thing. This is a universal, clear position that these are my principles, I should be able to speak my mind. But I know and I promote the respect of human beings, even though I don't agree with the behavior and what are their ethical 
uh, uh, values or uh, uh, so this is also the question about uh, intersectionality so the last uh, 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 question was about uh, oh yes the last question was do we have is it right to give money to politicians and to be involved so first uh, what is right is to deal with politicians and to meet with them and we can support politicians and we can even be politicians by the way okay we want to have people being ready for that with principles and with honesty now to deal with politicians is very important to have the dialogue what uh, the organization is doing to deal with your uh, local authority that's very important now it should be clear that uh, you support politicians based on what I said before. It's uh, the competence, it's the integrity, and it's uh, accountability that they are doing the job. But there is something which is important that you give money, and you can give money to support a political uh, project or a politician, but with the principles that it's not only to ask him, you give, we give you money because we want you in the future to protect our mask. It's not, we are not people to be bought in such a way. We are selling ourselves. No, I'm supporting your project because what I am expecting from you is more justice. It's more, uh, it's a, a real policy on the ground based on our common values. So to serve the community. So this is something which is completely possible. Many Muslims are doing it. Uh, many citizens are doing it, but it has to be ethical. We need more ethics in politics, and the people who should show this way are uh, citizens coming from different backgrounds, but ethics is essential in politics. Thank you. Number one multicultural channel. This is DAG TV.